All right. Well, hey, thank you very much for coming on The Worthy Physician. Please tell our listeners who you are and a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for inviting. It's a pleasure. When people ask me that question, one of the best titles I received was Boss of All Smiles. <laughs> and um, the, the story behind it is that I published a guided gratitude journal, Stress to Joy Guided Gratitude Journal. Mm-hmm. And my office manager took it, uh, you know, so she was working on it. I gifted it uh, to my staff and she had a four-year-old kid. And so he asked her, what are you writing? And she said, you know, how do you explain a four-year-old, the concept of gratitude, right? So she said, I'm writing all the things that bring smile on my face. And so then he looks at the book and he sees my picture and he says, who is this? And so um, she says, this is my boss. So he said, oh, so she is the boss of all smiles. (laughs) (laughs) And so that was a lovely title, but. Academically, I am an MD psychiatrist and an executive coach and corporate speaker. And I also host my podcast called Happy and Healthy Mind with Dr. Rosina. Before we started recording, you were telling me a little bit about your journey. And I'd like to get, I'd like to touch on that for a little bit, if that's okay. Sure. Have you yourself experienced burnout or moral injury? I feel like I have been at the brink of burnout multiple times. Right. Uh, being in the you know medical school or residency and practice, and uh, so many times the stress level goes to the point where I find myself at the brink of burnout. I start thinking like you know, am I in the right field? You know, I just feel like I want to quit. But I really don't want to quit because I also love my job. The satisfaction I get when I see a person who was coming with tears in his eyes, changing to smiles on their face, it Mm -hmm. gives me this inner joy. This is my calling. This is what I love to do. But sometimes stress becomes really intolerable. And then I find myself at the brink of burnout. And then I have to start utilizing all the tools that I teach others (laughs) in my life. And like I was saying, sometimes I joke in my you know webinars and my training and um, that I am teaching these things to you so I could hear myself and also apply it in my life so I right. can avoid burnout without quitting either my career or my health. Right. And what are some of those tools that you relied upon, you know, because you have a very long, successful career where you have evolved in in different aspects of bringing your expertise, such as your podcast, and you have a book that you've written, and then they're speaking. How do you incorporate those tools in order to, the master continues to be the master, but also also shifts to the student at times, right? Right, right. Yeah, and um, as I said, it's kind of, I consider life, the stressors in life, like traffic lights on road of life. Sometimes it's green and life is flowing smoothly. Yeah. And sometimes it's red, you have to stop. Yeah. And sometimes it's yellow. It's like, you know, either you gather all your energy to get through it or you slow down and take a break. And so I I go through these phases myself. Sometimes yeah. things are just flowing fine. And uh, I keep on practicing the tools that I have developed. But let me tell you, I was not always like that. Like, you know, I was always a type A, go, go, go personality, a little bit perfectionist, wants to do everything and achievement oriented. So like, you know, I was focused on that. And it so happened several years back when I I was done with my residency and like, you know, I was getting into setting up my own practice and the stress level was so high, you know, building your practice changes, we moved, EHR changes, everything was was like really at peak and my stress level reached to the point where I started seeing the signs of burnout, you know, absent-mindedness, and exhaustion. And although I'm a psychiatrist and I should know better because I treat a lot of injured workers, but you know how we have the tendency of I'll do it later. After right, absolutely. Then I'll do it. Yes. After this. So I was in that phase when one day when I was driving back from work, I zoned out while driving got into a car accident, broke my right hand, and I'm like totally dominant. Uh, my right hand is my dominant dominant hand. And so life 
went to a, another level of stress. And you know, that's when I remember that day when I was at, I felt that I hit my rock bottom when it was about a month after my accident, my husband had taken me to uh, visit the relatives so that I can kind of for change of scenery. Mm -hmm. And I was helped to go in the shower. And because of my broken hand, I could not change myself. So I uh, was supposed to call my relative to, when I was done. Well, I got done showering. I called, but they were downstairs and I was upstairs, so they could not hear my voice. And so nobody came up and I was stuck in the shower because I couldn't get out. So I reached a peak of helplessness and I went back in the shower and I was banging the wall of shower, you know, feeling like, you no, know, why me? And like you know, that uh, victim helpless state. And then I had my epiphany. I said, I'm banging the wall of shower with my left hand. What if I would have lost my left hand too? What if I had lost my eyes? or my mind, or my life. And I had a five-year-old kid at that time, and he was in the car with me for the whole week before that day, because he was sick, and that day he went back to the daycare. What if he was in the car? Right. And so that sudden thought shift helped me change my perspective, mm -hmm. get out of that phase of feeling like helpless victim, to feeling of little empowerment. And a few days later, when I was sitting in the bed at night, see, I'm a right-sided sleeper, so I had all these nails around my hand, and I could not sleep because of those nails around my hand. So I was sitting in the bed, and my friend had given me a journal. So I pulled the journal with my left hand and started writing with my left hand for the first time. And it was very, very crooked. That's okay. <laughs> and you can barely read what I wrote. But I wrote, I'm grateful for my left hand. That's an amazing change of perspective. Mm -hmm. And you won't believe, like, you know, before then, I knew about the power of gratitude. And I, you know, being a psychiatrist, I'm kind of teaching positive thinking, being grateful. But, you know, I did not have the time to practice myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always a very grateful person, so I would always say thank you. I would do my prayers on a regular basis. But that shift, when it happened, when I really felt grateful for the other things in my life, and I wrote with my left hand, I'm grateful for my left hand, my eyes to be able to see, because I could see in you know where I was, my bed, you know, there was a window and I could see the greenery outside mm -hmm. and having a husband sleeping on my side and a pillow to rest my hand and ability to endure this pain. And that really got me started on this journey of changing my perspective about things. And that was that day, 2004. To today, my day does not start without my gratitude journal. And so I carry it like today, I was like, you know, running late and the, getting my kid to school and stuff. I didn't get the chance. So I'm carrying my book. And before our recording, when I had a little time, that's when I finished my gratitude journal. So just having that established habit, you know, when you're feeling good and everything is going fine, it's easy to think about gratitude. Right. Yeah. But when things are not going fine, it is very hard. And so having this practice has helped me to ground myself every day, whether things are going well or not, and allows me to get through it because I know that there are some things that are working. And, you know, when I focus on that, then I get the more energy and ability to cope with other things. And so that is, if you were to ask me what is one thing that has helped me through all the difficult times since then, that is my gratitude practice. That's awesome. And I think that we, there's a lot of science behind that mm -hmm. because you could have spent the weeks that you had your hand in the, with, that you were unable to use your right hand and your right hand dominant. Okay. It's the times when we really need something, we don't have it. 
and we we realize how much we use it, right? Right, right. And the fact that you learned to, or that you were able to scribble out something with your left hand and you change that perspective, we know that that can also shift the mind and how it can also change how we frame things just even day-to-day life. And you mentioned something important called, that you, you said it keeps you grounded. Why is being grounded so important? I mean, I know what grounding means for me. Why is being grounded so important? Can you share that with us? Yeah, so it's like, you know, just imagine if you have a boat and if you don't have any anchors, what would happen to the boat? All the waves is going to take it in whatever direction the ocean can take, you know. Mm -hmm. So you would not have any basis to hold. And so you need to have something that gives you that grounding, that stability, Mm -hmm. so that when there is wind going or the waves in the water, uh, like, you know, when the trees are grounded with the roots, right? So the the stronger the roots, the more the tree is going to be able to withheld the stormy winds, right? Right. Um, And so there are certain anchors, there are certain roots that allow you to get through the difficulties in life. And so that is what my practice gives me that grounding and that allows me to get through the times when things are a little difficult right absolutely and and uh, it also gives me more joy when things are going good because like you said that there's a lot of science you know the the production of like you know uh, feeling good actually there is also research now that there is structural brain changes that could happen yes. by, with the regular gratitude practice yes. and so not only it helps kind of prevent and improve depression and anxiety and increases happiness and satisfaction in life it also improves your relationship with others because then you're grateful for people and the inner joy increases so there's like like lots of benefits and for me it's like that grounding that it provides thank you so much for bringing that up and through your career, about how many times would you say you've been on the brink of, of burnout, if it's possible to to count? Yeah, like, you know, it's a little bit here and there always happen. But like, you know, from starting from even our schools are such a setup for burnout. Like, you know, there's so much competitiveness. You want to be the first, you want to be on top. And people like... Um, like us in terms of like you know we are we are driven people so then we want to do more than just basic requirements so we want to excel in whatever we do so i remember getting a brink of burnout while trying to get into medical school and in medical school i remember having to go through when there's like relationship issues happening while you're going through the medical school and like you know all the societal pressures I reached to the point where I learned a lot of relaxation techniques through my teacher in the medical school who was a psychologist. So like all the things that she was teaching, I was trying to apply in my life to be able to get through that very, very hard medical school. And as I was telling you, we had a medical student, like, you know, our class fellow who actually committed suicide after second year and he was like in a top student so the stress of medical school itself can put you at brink of burnout and then you know doing the residency and moving the country and not being able to visit my parents when my father was having heart problem or so there's like many many different stages where I found myself to like really at the brink and there was something that helped me to get out of there mm-hmm. and then continue those practices so that I do not go to that level of burnout. And what I want to kind of clarify is that everybody's life presents different challenges. And yes. Yes. And people, there are certain careers that that puts much higher stress level, like, you know, in healthcare field, we are put on a much higher level of expectations and demands and following through and so so there is much higher demand on our capacity so we are constantly being tested yes we are constantly being tested and i'm not sure why you asked how many times i have been at the brink of burnout 
but I guess that you are also experiencing it multiple times, and that's why you asked? The reason why I ask is, you know, I think that burnout can happen to more than once, obviously. Uh, I've experienced it twice myself, both within the last 10 years. And so I had to make it, I had to make a change in the way I was practicing and I had to cut back my hours. I had to cut back my hours and refocus on what really brings me joy because I enjoy so many things outside of medicine, not, not just working, working, working. Right. And then the, my best friend dying by suicide really was a wake up call. And so that's the reason why I ask just, you know, how, how many times have you experienced it? And then, you know, what do you do to overcome it? And it sounds like you're pretty aware when you are starting to get to that point. Yeah, I think awareness is the first key. Right. And as I was saying, that sometimes even knowing that you need to be aware, sometimes you still get stuck in that trap. Sure. And one time I remember... I was I was seeing a nurse and she was telling me all the problems she's having about self-care. She doesn't have time to go for her own doctor's appointment and you know all these things. And I was brainstorming with her, okay, what if you do this? What if you do that? And you know, as I was doing it, I was feeling inside me saying, Rosina, hear yourself. You are sitting in back pain. You need to go make your chiropractic appointment. Mm -hmm. You are feeling guilty for canceling your patients to go take care of yourself. <laughs> and so I really kind of realized that, you know, I am neglecting myself and I'm setting myself. And that day, uh, like that weekend, I sat again with my journal. I wrote a dialogue between a doctor and a patient. You see, as a doctor, I'm a very good advisor to my patients. Right. But it's very hard for me to hear my own advice. Right. So I wrote a dialogue between a patient and a doctor when <laughs> I was the patient and I was the doctor. So I said, right. as a patient, I wrote down, I feel stuck in the web of my own creation. <laughs> yes, yes. And the thing is that, we're very good at giving advice, but it's very difficult for us to take our own advice in a sense. I was going to say that's one of the um, that's one of the things about the culture of medicine where we have to put the patients first always, and that's where I beg to differ because we're humans, we're not robots, we're not superheroes, and we're finite as well. So we have to make time for our own for our own health care and our own mental mm -hmm. sanity. And so that day when I wrote this thing, I was realizing it. So that's why I kind of wrote that. And that day I wrote for an hour and a half because every time I would suggest to myself something, I would come up with yes, but, yes, but. And so you know how <laughs> our patients do that, but like, you know, we do that even more when we are trying mm -hmm. to suggest something to ourselves. So, so I wrote that dialogue. And then at the end of that, I was able to reach to a, a decision that, Although it still took me another month to uh, modify my schedule so that there is a time slot available at least once a month where I can do my own doctor's appointments and self-care things. But just making that decision in writing mm -hmm. helped me feel like a big burden off my shoulders. Right. And so now I use that technique. I call it self-dialogue journal and I teach it in my book and courses and so a lot of people have applied and have benefited. Like I, I had one patient who was a teacher and I had her write a dialogue between a student and a teacher because she was a really good advisor as a teacher. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so she was able to kind of come up with her own resolution. I had some patients who were like, you know, mother-daughter dialogue or friend-to-friend -friend dialogue. And so if uh, one of our listeners is going through something like this, I would encourage you to do a self-dialogue journal and write something, you know, write what is the issue, what are your options, and what is an action plan. Mm -hmm. And as you would write, whatever advice comes, then follow your own advice. <laughs> and I hope it would help you like it helps me and many of my patients. Sure. And do you think that it's the power of seeing the words on paper that makes it so powerful? I think it is uh, the power of brain dumping <laughs> okay. you know how uh, our minds so we we have lots of thoughts right going yes. round and round and round 
And so our minds get full of so much thoughts that there's no space left for processing. Right. So when you put things out on the paper, it's like I call it emptying the mental garbage bin. <laughs> so you empty the mental garbage bin and then there is more space. It, like in the computer, if your memory gets to really full, you like, you know, delete some of the things so there's space for the computer to process. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Similarly, your brain needs space for it to process. So writing helps me get rid of those thoughts or get them out of my head and on the paper. Mm -hmm. And when they are on the paper, then I can organize it. I can see it. And so it's not like, you know, constantly one thought over and over and over again. It gets it out. It kind of organized. And then when I see it, then I'm able to kind of come to some kind of solution or conclusion okay, this is what makes most sense to me. And so, like, you know, different people use the journaling in different ways. And as mm -hmm. I said, like, you know, there's certain structures, like some people say, oh, I keep writing and it makes me more negative. Mm -hmm. Like, just imagine if writing it out is making you feel more negative, what is it doing inside your head? Because right. those thoughts are inside your head, right? Right, right. And That's so if you don't empty that mental garbage bin, it's like, you know, keeping the garbage in the home. How many days can you keep the rotten banana peel mm -hmm. in your home? Uh, what would happen if you are not just keeping it in home, but you keep it in your backpack and carry it with you? What would happen? A really, really bad stench. Really bad stench. <laughs> and the bees. Right. And you would attract a lot of bees and, and you would feel sick. So similarly, you know, thoughts, negative thoughts can do the same thing, better they're out than in. And so you mentioned that you had written a book. What is the name of that book? So I'll stress to joy, your toolkit for peace of mind in minutes. So for spending a few minutes a day, you can reach to the peace of mind. And why is it so important to have a peace of mind? I mean, I know for me, it's important to have a peace of mind to stay sane, to stay positive, to stay focused. But for the listener, why is it so important to have a peace of mind as, as a busy physician or as a busy adult trying to navigate life? Yeah, so if you have a lot of lack of peace going, like, you know, your mind is going in 10 different directions, what is going to happen? You won't be able to focus on things. Mm -hmm. You would do more mistakes because you would be absent-minded. You would zone out. Like I ended up zoning out and got it, got into a car accident. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a lot of medical errors that happens when, uh, you know, people are not able to focus. And so it's absolutely necessary for you to be able to settle your inner turmoil so you could be present in the moment, then you could be the best provider that you could be. Even if in, in the family, you could be the best parent you could be or the spouse or in the relationship because when you are not at peace, it shows in your words, it shows in your actions, and it shows in the neglect of the actions that you were supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So so a lot of problems could happen. And it's not easy to keep peace all the time, but just being aware and observing where you are mm -hmm. allows you to taper it down to the point where you can actually focus and do the things that you need to do. Sure. And through all the different trials and tribulations and the happy moments, what keeps you in practice? Like we had discussed prior to recording that you've been a psychi practicing psychiatrist and you, what keeps us as physicians, I think, are love the patients. They're, they're awesome to see the progress in those relationships. Besides that, what do you do that keeps you as a fulfilled physician that is not wanting to exit healthcare with with everybody else? Yeah, and that is so so uh, important for me. And when I see other healthcare professionals, like you know, quitting their practices, the amount of loss the society goes through is not just you know the person who is quitting they lose their career, their ability to earn high dollars. But at the same time, all the people they could have helped if they would have stayed in the field. We spent so many years preparing to be able to provide that care. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then stopping that means that benefit that this these patients could have had doesn't happen. And so, as I said, like, you know, I utilize a lot of these tools. And of course, we cannot go through everything in this small discussion. But I have a, a coaching program that I'm going to be starting for high achievers so they could learn these tools mm -hmm. and avoid, uh, like, you know, sometimes we reach to the point where the stresses are so high that we feel like either we have to quit our job or quit our health. But there is a middle solution. You can keep the job and keep your health and still feel that, you know, fulfillment of your purpose if, number one, you are keeping this awareness and this stress level under manageable levels so that you don't burn out. And sometimes I joke like, you know, when you are rubbing a matchstick again the, against the matchbox and there's a spark, mm -hmm. you know, a little spark is necessary for enough fire to cook things, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But too much of fire would burn the food. And if you have kind of burned this matchstick, and if it is like just on the top, as soon as you use the spark, you need to blow it up. So blow out, burn out before it burns you out. Right, right. <laughs> and so it's important to keep tab on where you are having some system of keeping a check on a daily basis or a weekly basis for me is journaling. And I know that it doesn't work for everybody. So everybody needs to come up with their own system of keeping awareness of where you are, taking the pulse of where your capacity is at any point in time. Another tool that I use for that purpose is called emotional coping account. So uh, you know how Everybody has a checking account, right? You have a checking account? Yes. Okay, so there are deposits in a checking account and withdrawals, right? Right. Uh, what happens if your withdrawals are more than your deposits? Of course, called an overdraft. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. And so similarly, and so what do you do if, if you feel like, you know, there is going to be an overdraft, you try to put extra deposits, right? Right. So that your balance is up and if there is an emergency withdrawal, you can still sustain in positive, correct? Yes. Similarly, all of us have an inner emotional coping account. Mm -hmm. All the things that we do to build our capacity to make us feel good, that make, make us feel expanded, are called deposits in your emotional coping account. All the things that are, you know, strain you or have the demand on you or deplete you are called withdrawals on your emotional coping account. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are some withdrawals that are not in your control, you know, your patient floor, your job, or your family responsibilities, your health is the overall withdrawals that are not in your control. So what you do is you increase your deposits to match the withdrawals so you can stay in positive. Mm -hmm. So just kind of having, keeping track of what is the balance in your emotional coping account mm -hmm. and then keep doing regular deposits. I actually, on my to-do list, you know, everybody does their to-do list, right? So in my to-do list, there is a task called deposits. Mm -hmm. And so I have all these options of deposits for my emotional coping account. And I would say, okay, today I, I can sit outside to look at the nature, or I can go for a walk, or I can take a tub bath, or I can read a nice book, or I play Sudoku. <laughs> that is my fun outlet or, or something. So if you do like small, small deposit on a daily basis, you keep on increasing your emotional balance so mm -hmm. if there is a withdrawal something happens at work or at home that really drains you you have capacity to handle it the wow. burnout happens is when the balance goes so low that mm -hmm. it any any small withdrawal kind of puts you into negative and right. that is what in my sense is the burnout sure so it's always trying to take care of that or schedule that self-care make sure that you keep your own needs on that radar Correct. And then sometimes people feel guilty, like I was earlier saying, that as, as healthcare professionals, we feel guilty for taking care of ourselves, even as mothers, even as like, you know, caretakers, we right. feel guilty for taking care of ourselves, kind of shifting that perspective to let me take care of this for myself so I can take better care of my family, for my patients, for my staff. So right. like you're doing the self-care in service of also others. Because right. if you if you burn out, then you won't be there to be able to continue to provide 
good care that you would like to do, that you're meant to do. Right, right. Thank you for saying that because we have to change that mindset. Mm -hmm. And I especially think as, and this is not meant to rub the listener the wrong way, but I think that as females, you know, there's this kind of a, there's a double standard. Like we have to be able to work and then do everything else. And sometimes it is external uh, expectation and sometimes that's internal expectation. Yes. So like, yes. you know, what we what we see, you know, grow up seeing. And so I like automatically feel the urge to take care of things, even though I know if I don't take care of things, I have like, you know, a very caring partner who would take care of things or my kids are like, you know, old enough to be able to. But still, like, you know, that inner expectation until especially until I realized I used to feel really guilty mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or anything like and then I was like. Even if I say, okay, I'm going to go get a haircut or or nails or something, I would feel bad saying that I'll take care of myself. Once I learned to change this perspective, and that's the thought training I'm talking about, that I had to go through that. I tried to take my clients go through where we work on identifying these underlying belief system and then learning to modify them to what is appropriate and not automatically flow something that has been built up in childhood or adulthood without our awareness. So, yeah, so that is one of the major tools that I use in my toolkit to get the peace of mind for myself and help others. No, thank you very much. I think that's very insightful, to be honest with you. I really love the analogies that you've used. You know, I think they're very relatable. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And so if the listeners wanted to reach out to you, how do we find you? My website is drrosina.com. So D-R-R-O-Z-I-N-A.com. And that is the hub for all my um, services and my products. Our listeners today probably would be really interested in my Stop Burnout Without Quitting ebook. Um, I am going, and so that would be available as a free download on the website. I'm going to be doing some free training on the topic and starting a coaching program uh, where we would not only just learn the basics of burnout, but we would also get ourselves checked in terms of where we are in terms of our stress level. And you know, when there is chronic stress, it doesn't only affect your mind, but it definitely also affects your body. And our adrenal glands that are responsible for producing the stress hormones after producing the cortisol over a long time, they start malfunctioning sometimes. Sometimes they get fatigued. So sometimes people develop adrenal fatigue and they get so exhausted and they don't know like, you know, why all the rest in the world is not giving them the rest because their adrenals are fried or they're like really fatigued. And so we also work on being an integrative psychiatrist. I also use a lot of natural remedies to help the adrenals repair itself and work on lifestyle modifications so that we can be whole again and the best version of ourselves so we can continue to achieve more, serve more, make the impact we are meant to make without quitting either our health or our jobs. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. Thank you for saying that the adrenal glands, we don't give them enough credit in the, in the world of stress. What is one pearl of wisdom you would like to leave our listeners? So I would say that our minds are the software that runs the hardware of our brain and our body. And so therefore I teach uh, the simple tools like that you can use to keep your software in the best working condition. Mm -hmm. And every day is a new opportunity to make new decisions. So continue to make one small improvement every day, day after day, and your life would would be changed, transformed into the best version of you. So I leave you with the question, what is the small change you are going to make 
towards a better self today. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate everything you've said. Thank you. It's a pleasure if it, it, even one person's life gets better or one person's life gets saved, then I would be closer to my purpose of life. Exactly. Exactly. Beautifully said. Thanks for joining us. If you have enjoyed this episode, click, subscribe, share it with a friend, because we could all use a little bit of normalizing the topic of burnout, knowing that we're not alone.